welcome to happy hour. How was your day? Uh, okay, not a bad day. <laughs> semi-productive day. <laughs> I'll take semi-productive over. Yeah, it'll do. <laughs> well, welcome to happy hour. Here we have with us um, Steve Weatherall, the author of the Doomsday, I'm sorry, the Doomsayer Journeys, which is a quirky comical look at an impending disaster um, and the unlikely heroes that are hoping to stop it. That's right. Hi, how do you do? Um, I did write the Doomsday book. I'd probably be a lot more famous, but oh well. Like actually talking about global warming and stuff. (laughs) Too too real. People, People are tired of People are tired of all the scary stuff. This is is much more fun and... (laughs) Actually, I'm going to edit that out. No no spoilers, because maybe maybe they don't. We don't know. Well, they're not technically the human race. We never find out what happens to the human race in that book. So so it's been the air. They were just the ones that caused the problems in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) That's what we're good at. It's true. It's true. What are you drinking? I am drinking something called Dragon Head, which was sent to me by a mystery benefactor. <laughs> I, hope, uh, I hope it's good. I There were no reviews on it. It was just like there were not a whole lot of options as far as what I could ship from, <laughs> from where I am. It's really good. It's, um, look at that. It's like nice. brown ink. Nice. I like uh, I like dark ale. This is kind of a it says it's a stout, but kind of kicks like a porter does. It's about four percent. It's nice. I, it's good. I actually threw my can away, but I I have a porter too. I always drink the coconut uh, coconut porter from the Maui uh, coconut brewing coconut. company, and it's dark like that too. And it's got like like almost a coffee sort of flavor to it. Nice. Dark and bitter and mostly empty, like my soul. That's how I like my beer. Hell yeah. Um, well, let's cheers to the end of the world and see if we can get a little bit drunk before. <laughs> I'm sure we'll manage. Oh, man. So for those of you who haven't read the Doomsayer series, um, Steve, would you like to tell us a little bit about Hayden Strike and Bip? Hand and Strike and Bip Plunkerton are two characters descended from the same ethereal alien race who has uh, evolved past the concerns of most modern societies and uh, has in, have innate abilities to, I guess, quantopathically, I think is the word I use, to manipula- manipulate things telepathically on a kind of molecular level. And uh, they're... The adventure is set on the planet Bursch, which is just a world where various familiar fantasy tropes are reality. And instead of saving this uh, planet, the alien race are shot down by a maniacal emperor, quite by accident. So the two characters are a thousand years apart, not to spoil it too much. One is Hand and Strike. He's uh, very much an archetypal adventure hero to the point of uh, making fun of that archetype, I guess. He's very much a... He becomes almost semi-aware that he is an adventure archetype, and due to a series of of, uh, mishaps which results in him being immortal, becomes thoroughly sick of it. So he's a badass, but very cynical and bored with the whole deal. Kind of like Mal from uh, Firefly. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, uh, I'm not... I'm not actually that big a Firefly fan. A Firefly <laughs> fan. Well, then I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I just pictured that actor in the role. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, the other character is Bit Plunkerton, quite the opposite. Um, a young hopeful from a settlement from a very different time, um, very unprepared to be saving the world, but thrust into the role anyway. And he's kind of the naive hopeful that um, counterbalances Handon's sort of ingrained cynicism. So, um, Despite the stakes being so high and, you know, total destruction and everyone dying looming in the, in the distance, um, it's got a really whimsical sort of tone. 
um, a lot like Good Omens or something in that in that sort of almost a story old old fashioned storybook kind of poetic. Yeah, I mean thought. that's um, I think that's kind of you, you know it's um, funny you mentioned Good Omens. I'm a really big Terry Pratchett fan. I think the Doomsday it was the first novel I tried to write. I think. I tried to write it originally with a friend in uh, high school. Uh, we thought we were both big Terry Pratchett fans. We thought, oh, we'll write a book. That'll be fun. And it turned out to be enormously difficult. So uh, we went our separate ways on that. And then I spent a long time just kind of plugging away at it um, until I sort of found my voice. And yeah, I think for a while there, I was just, I wanted to write a Discworld novel, basically. And it eventually became my own thing after many, many rewrites. Um, so I think that kind of, I don't know if that's a British comedy tradition, really, or a, a British sci-fi comedy tradition, not so much the whimsical, but the awareness of human naffness, I guess. Um, and I guess you can see the calm, the calm acknowledgement <laughs> that something really sucks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you see it in, um, oh my God, Douglas Adams. I've just forgotten the most popular sci-fi comedy series name in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Of course. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. God, that just went right out of my head there. But also in things like Red Dwarf, um, and especially in the Pratchett, what they do is they take the fantastical and um, end of the world stakes and they put quite ordinary crap British viewpoints in it. And uh, I don't know, it works. It's very Monty Python. Yes, that was the, yes, that was another one I was going to bring up. And I might be drawing parallels between real stuff and, uh, and stuff in the book, because I realized that a lot of the stuff that you wrote was before, you know, pre the pre 2016, if you know what I'm saying. And <laughs> so it's almost a little bit prophetic. Did you intend it to be purely entertaining or were you unpacking some heavier issues? Uh, I think I always intend to be entertaining. I generally want to make people laugh and just try and grab them a little bit. Unpacking issues. Yeah, I think, I don't know. There's a lot of people who say in relation to writing that everything is political, which is technically true in the same way that everything is scientific. It's absolutely true, but uh, completely useless. Um, I do think it's very, it would be very difficult to write anything without unloading some of your viewpoint into it. So I think, yeah, there's probably some, I guess, conversations with myself while I was writing that. I'm sure that's true of every writer. I don't mind presenting kind of larger issues about the state of the world i think that comedy has to do that it has to be insightful in order or in order to be funny you know on some level but um i like to think those things are conversations because i'm not really that clever so i don't have the answers and i don't pretend i do have the answers so you know funnily enough my characters don't have the answers either so well, i think i just like to you know let them talk it out well, that's humble of you because in a weird way, admitting that you don't have the answers is half the battle. And like that, that is kind of the answer. Like the, the whole overlying theme that you reach at the end, realizing that the moment that you think that you know everything is when you really don't, you, you really don't know anything. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, you know, particularly if you've been on Facebook or Twitter where it appears everybody believes exactly the opposite but um that's true yeah well i think that's i don't know i think it's probably the most enjoyable way to write um i don't think you could probably sit down and think of the theme you want to explore and maybe you can think of the message you want to imprint on people and for them to take away and certainly I, there are lots of writers who are perfectly capable of doing that and do it very well and hopefully do it with some subtlety and nuance so you don't feel like you're being pulpited to. But um, I'm, again, I'm just not that smart. I, I can, I'd love to, I'd love to explore themes, but um, it really is an exploration. It's not a, it's not me uh, talking down from the mountain at anyone. No, but it is asking interesting questions and, you know, kind of confronting people with 
some really seriously deep stuff in, in a way that's more palatable because it's sweet and funny and and easy to digest in that way. Oh. Well, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> that's the goal. Well, <laughs> cheers to immortality because your book is going to be around forever. So that's something. That'd be nice. Is that weird? Kind of when I think of some of the books I've written, maybe, maybe not the best thing. But. <laughs> I was talking to Emily about that last time I was interviewing somebody on here. She was like, I really don't know if I want that to be the thing that I'm known for. <laughs> it's like the, it's, I, was I, I really to... feel like it's going to be one of those things that catches on after all of you guys are, are dead. And then everybody's going to be like, these were so ahead of their time. <laughs> I was talking to an author called uh, Dakota Krauts on a podcast. And uh, I'm on a podcast with much more popular authors. So he was familiar with their work. And then he came to me and said, oh, you, you probably haven't heard of my stuff. He went, oh, wait a minute. Are you the same Steve Weverell from Werewolves of Planet Sex? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's weird That's... you'd know me from that. That's a very strange book. Too. <laughs> but apparently they'd kind of had this... Uh, I think they call it a tingle party and they just got all these books of really weird covers and mine had come up and he'd read it and really enjoyed it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> as long as someone is, that's fine. <laughs> well, your name is out there. What are your top five favorite books? Top five favorite books. That's a difficult one. Uh, I could, if I was feeling lazy, I could probably populate them all with Terry Pratchett books, but I won't do that. I'll pick one Terry Pratchett book. Um, Guards, Guards, probably. I think that was not the one I started on, but probably my favorite. Uh, the one I started on was Weird Sisters, which is a good place to start. A lot of people are asking about, you know, where they should start with Pratchett. Weird Sisters is a good one. Uh, who else? My second favorite, probably the Gorman Gas trilogy, which sounds like I'm trying to be clever. But it really is um, It's probably the first book I, it's quite a hard book. I don't often read to challenge myself, but it's filled with these wonderful uh, character descriptions and everybody has these very specific dialogue um, patterns. And I think it's probably influenced quite a lot of what I do, but um, I'm no Mervyn Peake, but it is... Uh, I think if you're the sort of person who's interested in going a little too far with your descriptions, read uh, read the Gorman Gas trilogy. It's a wonderful experience. Uh, number three, I'm going to go for John Dies at the end because I really love the author David Wong. It might probably not his best book to be honest, but I think he released it online first before he was picked up, and I was kind of there at the beginning for it sort of following it along as it got picked up and it eventually got turned into a movie and it was really cool to see that happen so uh, I, I just got kind of a soft spot for that book where am I am I on this number three isn't three. it this is three yeah uh I think I should probably pick a Roddy Doyle book I do like Roddy Doyle I think he's probably my favorite sort of slice of life author I'll go for the woman who walked into doors because that's the one I can remember right now. And it is a really good book. <laughs> Walking into doors, like closed doors or glass doors or just like wow. portals to other dimensions. What's this about? <laughs> no, nothing so fantastical is about, it's a really depressing book about a woman who gets beat up by a husband a lot. So oh, nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a wonderful bit of writing. I, I, was, I was thinking like actually walking into doors, not the excuse of, yeah, okay, it's all coming together. I'm, I'm stupid. It's good. I don't, I don't know if I've sold that particularly well now, but it's a beautifully written book. Really, Roddy Doyle's fantastic at, at character work. Uh, number five, uh, I think I'd go for Martin Amis or Amos for the same reason. I really like him as a... Um, He's kind of a slice of life writer, but with a sort of real touch of the bizarre to him and the um, and the sinister. I quite like his style. I'll go for the Rachel Papers, which I think is the first book of his I read. Um, it's a bit 
deliberately misogynistic and adolescent. Um, and it's quite just a nice char- character study of a complete piece of shit. So yeah, <laughs> go for that one. You like you like the interesting, flawed main character, huh? Uh, yeah. You know what? I didn't put Stephen King on any of that list. I don't know if Stephen is this because Stephen King is just effectively background noise. I read a lot of Stephen King. I like the vast majority of his stuff. I think I could have put Stephen King on that list. I don't know. What, I, it, what I is your favorite list. Stephen King? I think I think everybody, you know, everybody and their mother reads Stephen King or has read Stephen King at some point. What was mm. your favorite Stephen King book? Good question. I think I read Salem's Lot was the first one I read, and I read it when I was about. 13 so probably the right age to, to write that if you want to if you want to scare yourself a little bit uh so i'll go for that but i really like the dark tower oh. not just i mean i loved the series up until about book five and then i just finished it because i needed to finish it but i really like the dark the gunslinger the first book just as its own piece of weird little fiction i think if he if he never wrote anything else in that series again i'd still really like that book I think the thing that's great about Stephen King is he's just like, he, at this point, he doesn't care about anybody's rules. He does what he wants. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we will continue buying it because it's Stephen King. Um, Desperation, when I came across this hardbound copy of Desperation in a thrift store for 50 cents, and I was 18, and it was one of the first books that I owned when I got out on my own. And I had owned a ton of Stephen King books previously, um, some of which I like had to keep hidden because my mom was very uh, protective and wanted to make sure that I was only consuming wholesome material, you know, and Stephen King isn't exactly, you know, always the most, (laughs) he's really not. (laughs) And so, you know, little 16 year old me had had a little Stephen King stash in a, uh, in an ammo, uh, box you know those green like military ammunition yeah. box yeah I had I had some Stephen King books <laughs> hidden in one of those out in the woods outside my house <laughs> jeez yeah it was it was like the holocaust up in there no not really my mom my mom's a wonderful person but man she she very carefully monitored what kind of uh fiction I consumed And um, when I got out on my own and I could own whatever books I wanted, Stephen King, Desperation was one of the first books that I picked. So for that reason alone, even though it's a super, super fucking depressing book, I I, I just have a special place for for Desperation. I do as well, because it was one of, I think people are disparaging about airport books, but I'm not, because I remember being a kid and if you had to go on a plane like pre-internet and people having phones it was just dire it was a dire experience i remember picking up I mean, there were two like i've got two or three all-time favorite life-saving airport books desperation is one of them so i owe that book a lot it yep. got me out of a dark place yeah yeah because in the beginning you're going through this um uh that whole god is cruel uh phase where you're like no no and then it's like, <laughs> god is cruel because life is cruel nature is cruel like you know it's it's a it's a maturing process before you're sometimes able to absorb certain ideas especially you know if you're raised in a religious household and i'm going way off track i, I told you this this beer is like heavy way too much way too much alcohol for for this how is much what is for. <laughs> it out there. starting starting to just get uh get the things that you're not supposed to talk about out in the open whoops um <laughs> but returning to our uh, original line of questioning in your book science and magic working uh together as almost the same thing well they are the same thing and you have you, don't do, do you spell science in a different spell way. It wrong. I spell it, it's, I don't know, even know it's pronounceable yes, different. I spell it science as in like, psychic and science. Sort yeah. of together. Okay. It's one of those things that I thought would be really clever on paper, but then I did not consider the narrator for the audiobook at all in that decision. But, um, 
well, like yeah, I listened really to the audio job. book before I read it so I only actually like went in to physically read like snippets of certain parts and then I saw that you had spelled it different and I didn't know that when I first heard the audiobook before so mm -hmm. I thought that that was kind of cool can you explain how science works in Canic? well I'm going to um lead again with saying I'm not really that clever so you can put a lot of for into how magic works in a system and originally Birch was supposed to be a, a planet where people could wield magic rather than just it's very much a fantastical planet and impossible things do exist there but in the end I just decided to stick to one magic in that universe particularly which is called science which is the ability to telepathically manipulate things at a quantum level so if you're sufficiently trained in it, you can do everything a fairy tale wizard can do. But there's just um, there's no magic books or staffs or waving of the hands. It's all just uh, done on kind of a psychic level. And the way I explained that was just um, it was in an inherent ability within a species. And some people had more of it. Some people had less of it, which was a very neat way of not explaining how anything really works. So. <laughs> that worked out for me well the when when you first see bip doing magic or science it kind of reminded me of uh you, do you remember that john travolta movie phenomenon where he's talking yes. about the pencil moving the pencil back and forth and that that was what it made me think of was just being able to communicate with matter acknowledging that you are made yeah. up of the same thing as everything else and it was actually I thought it was pretty clever like you keep saying I'm not very clever but, it, <laughs> well, <laughs> but it's, it's you kind make, of it makes sense with yeah. physics so well it's out there and you know it's out there in comic book fiction a lot as soon as you get somebody who can move things with their mind like a Jean Grey character Eventually, if you double down on that enough, uh, eventually you'll get some, well, why can't she just shift molecules around if she can move things with her mind? Why can't she be the phoenix? Why can't Wanda Maxima control reality? Um, so, yeah, when you say psychic powers, you can just kind of do what you like with it. And then if you do, like in the same way X-Men say, oh, mutation, I say, well, the clarions just evolved differently than we did you know it's not i don't think you have to be i'm always really impressed when people have kind of like really intricate magic systems in their books it's very cool i really like that sort of thing if they can make it just believable enough for me that i can sort of forget that magic obviously isn't real then uh i really appreciate that but um sometimes you just need enough of an explanation to make the things you want to happen on the page so <laughs> for sure that's kind of where I am with that kind of trying to make it make sense there were two things that stood out as really profound in the book and one was how you said when humans are perfectly happy they kind of cease to be productive you know kind of like on Wally -E, when all the people get fat and they don't really know why they exist they just do um, and it's not to say that people have to be miserable but there is a joy and struggling when you're working towards something. And um, was that something, is that a philosophy that uh, finding happiness and being incomplete, do you embrace that in your own life or is that just something that you were kind of feeling at the time? It's a really interesting question and philosophically a more and more pertinent question as we get to conversations about automation and what uh, humanity does when they don't have jobs and how much I think I think uh, the pursuit of happiness is a great thing. I've seen that happiness, achieving a state of happiness, is not necessarily the best thing. There are billionaires out there who are miserable, and they, they shouldn't be, right? But they are. That's, That's when you start, getting, <laughs> you start getting sex dungeons and just getting weirder and weirder when you get to that point. <laughs> exactly. I think if you've got something to strive for, you're right. And there's a satisfaction in a job well done. I had a job as a delivery driver once and it was tough and it wasn't really well paid. I had to move like tons of paving slabs to the backs of old ladies' gardens because they couldn't do it themselves, obviously. 
I could have made them do it themselves, I suppose. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I want to see you do that. Just be like, move it yourself, you're old. You say I was legally obliged to leave it curbside. That was the uh, the remit of my job. But, um, <laughs> uh, you'd get, you'd come back from a day like that and you'd feel satisfied, like physically and mentally satisfied that you could just clock off for the day because you worked hard. And I do think if we ever get to the stage where, you know, there's universal income because the robots are doing everything. I don't know, after being in, I've been working from home in lockdown for a while. My goals and kind of place in society are not what they were. And I don't know, it feels different. I don't know what would happen if tomorrow somebody just gave me a big sack of money and said, hey, you don't have to work anymore. I don't know if it would make me a better person. I don't know if I do more things or um, just um, drink a lot more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer, but I do think the pursuit of happiness is probably um, a more of a sure thing than happiness. Satisfaction. I know sometimes I'd just be some of the happiest times in my life are when I'm not particularly doing anything. I'm just sort of chilling out on the couch with my kids or something, watching a movie. I wouldn't call that some triumphant joy. It's just a reliable satisfaction that I think is something that can be healthily strived for by anyone. That's awesome. Let's cheers to Stephen King because we've all read him. And even though he didn't make the top list it's because he's a given i don't know i think anyone's top five is probably always fluctuating i That's think on any other day a stephen king book might have uh might have crawled its way in there oh yeah well like the stand that was one that was one of the ones that i actually owned that was a good one and the stand was a good one yeah Surprisingly, the movie was pretty good too. The old movie with the really bad acting. It had Molly Ringwald in it. Do you remember that one? I do vaguely. I'm... <laughs> Stephen King's one of those things. Like, there are very if you try and make a Stephen King book into a movie, verbatim, <laughs> kind of like word for word, it just never works. Yeah, but... even the super trimmed down ones are a mini series. <laughs> mm. I think the only time it works is when they do short sto- stories, like um, Stand by Me and Green Mile. And oh. I was about to say Schindler's, Schindler's List. He definitely didn't write that. Uh, what's the one where he's <laughs> Shaw, Shawshank Redemption, that's the one. And there was a sh sound. But weirdly enough, my favorite movie is, one of my favorite movies is The Shining, which is um, probably the most loosely adapted Stephen King. I've seen uh, three versions of that movie, I think. I know there was a TV movie and there was a, a sequel recently. The Dr. Steve, really... did you see it? Yes. I think that was the last movie I saw before lockdown. I'm not positive, but I think. Might be, yeah. Oh, that's not, nobody wants that spot. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the, the fall. I enjoyed Dr. Sleep. That was good. It was fun. But The Shinings, I think Stephen King hated that movie. And there's a lot of people who like really fiercely defend the book. But I think what King did with the language of writing with prose, Kubrick did with the language of filmmaking. So I think it just depends if you're kind of into cinematography and uh, filmmaking. Well, the Shining's Stephen... got a lot to a lot to offer. For sure. For um I do notice like Stephen King likes to insert little parts of himself in everywhere, not just in his cameos with the big fake teeth, but he'll insert a little saying or something, just a, a few lines of dialogue in the movie It, the old one with uh, Tim Curry as Pennywise. Um, Tim Curry is Pennywise. The Scars Guard fella, he did a good job, but uh, Tim Curry didn't have a lot to work with in that miniseries adaptation and he He's, he is Pennywise to me. Yeah, I think that was probably my first Tim Curry movie. And uh, that's, you know, that's how, I, that's how I see Pennywise when I think but of him. They do say in the meme, you can know someone by where they first saw Tim Curry. 
I first <laughs> saw Tim Curry when he was trying to murder the little orphan Annie. <laughs> Annie the <laughs> oh, oh man. And Actually, shortly after that, I saw Tim Curry as uh, Long John Silver in Muppet Treasure Island, which is super fucking underrated, if you ask me. That was a musical. Yes. They had some good writers on that show. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. People don't, you know, they think it's got some Muppets in it. I'm not going to take it seriously. But uh, the Muppets, they got a damn fine writing team behind them. <laughs> and they are each accomplished performers in their own right. For sure. Um, but um, Bill, the character in um, It that was the writer, he is writing the screenplay. He's working with his wife, who's an actress, on the screenplay of one of his books. And he's a horror writer. And he says, well, if they're going to hire somebody to butcher one of my books, it may as well be me. And I was like, I feel like this is coming from somewhere. Like, yeah. I don't Let know. Let it go, he... King. <laughs> You're rich and famous. I don't know. Don't he likes it. his movies. I think, <laughs> I think he just wants to write excellent books, but too many of us are like uh, lazy. <laughs> well, he had to go at directing one of them. I think he was, uh, what was it called? Overdrive, the one where all the trucks come to life. Oh, oh yeah. my God! Did he that. that? Was it bad? Yes, yes, it was bad. Emilio Estevez uh, versus a truck. Oh, there you go. It's like evil Transformers, only they don't turn into robots. They don't. They just sort of drive around a bit. He had ACDC do the soundtrack as well. Do you remember Joyride? I think it was Paul Walker, where it was a truck driver that was uh, like psycho killer. And I think I know what you're talking about. I might be getting it mixed up with uh, the Hitcher. I'm probably getting. He would up talk on the it. CB radio, and he was like, "Candy Cane, where are you?" Because Paul Walker pretended to be a girl over the CB radio, and they were just like fucking around. They were like, "Come to this hotel room with some pink champagne." Oh my and god, then, that sounds terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, the uh, they basically trick this burly truck driver into bringing a bottle of pink champagne to the room next door, the motel room next door to them. And then the guy shows up with the bottle of pink champagne and then murders the people in the hotel room. Because, like, it was supposed to be a prank, but then, it, you know, it snowballed and then... Uh, As we used to. The truck driver... <laughs> makes it his mission to find whoever it was that tried to prank him. And then I think my friends and I started doing prank calls after that movie, which is really not smart. Teenagers are so dumb. Why do you we want to away, be murdered it, so badly? You took away exactly the wrong message from that movie. As teenagers do. <laughs> what about your three favorite rock bands? You like rock music, right? You do like, like rock, music. rock I like... Um, these days, I've always been pretty eclectic because I don't have a great memory, so I can never remember albums or chronology. So I'm just kind of, I'm more of a mixtape kind of guy, which is good. Uh, I kind of, I get into the car of my kids and they will put their choices on the radio because I have no say in these things anymore. <laughs> And uh, my steps. Because when we were kids, our parents got to have all the decisions made. You know, they we had to we yeah. had to know what they said, and then as parents, we give our kids free reign because we never want them to know the pain that we suffered <laughs> under the boot of our parents who made us watch cops every day. So we're just screwed all the way through yeah. life. <laughs> well, they uh they grew up with the internet, so they've got really kind of like my stepsons into like really obscure metal and like older metal than what I'd been into. He's like getting me into things like Warish and some other kind of like some really kind of uh rough punk stuff that's coming up now, which is cool. And my daughter's into some weird stuff as well. She's got me onto Mother Mother and all these kind of trendy things that I would have <sighs> just completely missed. My daughter loves um, Mother Mother too. I like the one with the rooster on the cover. That one was pretty cool headed rooster yeah again i don't know much about albums i just kind of i i just youtube stuff and just favorite the one i like i i interrupted you back to your mixtape thing what was on your your rock mixtape oh my top three yeah i think i i think i interrupted myself 
because uh, <laughs> I completely lost the thread on that question. Um, so I don't know. I think if I was going to have the top three albums, it'd probably be, I know two of them would be the stuff I religiously listened to as a teenager and can still listen to now without a hint of embarrassment or self-consciousness. So that would probably be the Pixies and Faith No More. I'm tempted to put Nirvana as the third one, but I think that was kind of of its time. But um, I really like David Bowie. I listen to a lot of Bowie, but that's not really a rock band. Well, some of it's, it's some of it it's was, rock. But... I, I consider it rock. I don't know. There you go. It was I'll, 80s. He wore tight pants. His ha- his hair was bigger than his body. Yeah, the uh, Ziggy Stardust stuff, the the Mott the Hoople. That was all. That was rock and roll. Hell yeah! I uh, Black Sabbath. That was that was one of my go to go to. Uh, good band. choice. I liked uh, Meatloaf, even though that's not really. A, is that a, is that considered a band or just an artist? I don't know. If we can, uh, he's a band. <laughs> he couldn't have done that by himself. Come on now. No, I mean, I get the impression that he probably had the same lineup trying to remember when Bat Out of Hell. I think he's just kind of always had the same lineup. So I don't think I don't think it's a share situation. You know, and it, it makes me a little bit sad because he doesn't even really want to acknowledge his music. So by loving his music so much, I'm kind of like undermining him as an artist because he wants to be an actor. He doesn't want to think about he doesn't want to think about the 80s. I would say that's Meatloaf's problem. If you are gonna <laughs> think like that, you know, don't write <laughs> Dead Ringer for Love. <laughs> yeah, like his voice just broke my heart. I loved it so much. And for like the third one, I don't even know. Like if if I, if you consider indie rock or like, I don't know, alternative rock, probably Counting Crows. It's not, they don't, it's not like they're hard. You know, I just like, I just like the band. I like their lyrics and I listen to them when I'm depressed and it makes me feel better about being depressed because I can just really embrace embrace the the sadness. 90s alt rock was good for that. It was primo for that. I've always kind of liked the quirky stuff. I like um I like ambiguity in music. That's what chokes me up when something's manic and depressing at the same time. That's why I quite like the Pixies. They'll just uh just they exist on this weirdly adolescent frequency just of uh, somewhere between kind of manic sincerity and ironic depression I guess <laughs> what was the last concert you went to oh god uh, I haven't been to a concert for ages I went to a festival in London and I got to see Lemmy before he died in Motorhead and I got to see Chris Cornell before he died uh, when they re- they toured briefly as Soundgarden. And I also got to see Faith No More. So that was a hell of a fucking lineup. And that was, uh, but that was a while ago. And I don't think I've been to a, a big rock event since. I, um, this is actually kind of embarrassing. I had never been to a rock concert up to this point. So it was my first and my last one that I've been to. But it was a festival. It was aftershock right before COVID hit. It was October before COVID hit. Oh, dear. I got to go to this amazing concert right before aftershock hit with my baby nephew, who is six years younger than me. He's not a baby at all. He's he's a big he's a big boy. He drove all the way down from uh, Oregon to take me to this concert. And we hadn't seen each other in years at this point. We stayed up all night the night before because we were too excited to sleep and then went in. And we went to see Marilyn Manson, who was someone that we always listened to in the quiet secret silence of our, you know, my bedroom. I'd play it on my, uh, my CD player with headphones on his little, you know, his little tiny 10 year old head. And I'd put eyeliner on him and we would silently rock when our parents weren't looking. (laughs) But I, I, kind of i did the three day rock concerts quite a lot the reading festival um used to be really cool and it kind of sold out and got big i think i was maybe like 25 
and I was at one of these things and I woke up, I was woken up at seven in the morning, which is ridiculous because everybody was drinking till dawn. Right. By some like really young people having a conversation about herbal tea, really <laughs> loud and enthusiastic conversation about herbal because tea. Because of England. <laughs> and I thought, I'm already t- fucking too old for this. So. <laughs> How old were you when your kids were born? Uh, I got with my ex when I was about 23 and she already had a kid. So that's my stepson. And my daughter was born when I was about 26, I think. So you're actually responsible. Like that actually makes sense. I don't know about responsible. <laughs> we won't talk about the, the, the visions of things to come. I feel like you kind of unpacked a lot of these issues before you started your book. And I honestly, I don't think I would have gotten a lot of the concepts that you were putting out there. I would have thought, oh, this is a fun sci-fi book, but it really didn't hit home for me until after uh you know the world got crazy um so do you feel a little bit like a rock star since you kind of hit your stride like putting this stuff out right before everything happened well I mean obviously it was on your mind so you you were maybe just a little bit smarter at seeing what was going on already I think there's just kind of I don't know I mean that book I'd been writing, or that trilogy, I mean, it never really was a trilogy. It's kind of, I turned it into a trilogy at some point due to some misguided self-publishing um, instinct. <laughs> but I guess uh, the Doomsday, uh, the collection, I, I think that took me about five or six years to write. So we're talking about from the age of 20 to like, I didn't finish till after my daughter was born. So maybe even longer than that. So that's a lot of growing up in that time. And I've always been interested in kind of what's going on around the world and the kind of discussions that people have. And I know there's kind of a plural. That's not a word. Plur, can I say this? This is a word I think, but I never really said out loud. Plural, plurality. There we go plurality to my upbringing um which kind of i guess makes me gives me a a fairly unique perspective on things sort of an outsider perspective on things so i don't know i don't think there's anything i certainly didn't set out to make a intelligent commentary on the way things were or how I think think things were going to go (laughs) (laughs) happy accident but you gotta remember like in the 90s we all grew up with this is not the first environmental crisis and you know justified hysteria we've been through remember in the 90s being at school and they were just basically saying well we're going to be underwater in 15 years kids so Let's all make some colorful posters about that. Kevin Costner um, in Waterworld. We were like, it's happening, guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's my future. I guess I shouldn't learn to swim or um, be a mutant. So <laughs> I don't think, I don't know. I think people have got short memories because it feels good to be, I don't know. I don't want to sound too cynical, but it feels good to be outraged about things particularly if you don't think you can do anything about it. And people seem to forget that what they're out, outraged about now, we've been outraged about in some form or, or another for quite a while. We just didn't have the internet. So now everybody's panic is, we have an outlet for our panic and it's to just shotgun blast it into everyone else's face. I'm genuinely surprised by the amount of people I friend on Facebook and uh, I'll friend them, inevitably strangers, because I just kind of network with a lot of people. And I'll see a meme about despairing about such and such political or environmental thing. Okay, and I'll see another one and I'll check their timeline. And it's just all of that. And I'm thinking, I don't know, this isn't really a friendship. This is just you 
you're obviously dealing with something here and uh you know i'm not your therapy wall oh man <laughs> <laughs> it's like i know it might feel good for you to like scream into the night but i don't know it doesn't make for a very fun and relaxing scrolling experience sure although i i do think that um that that kind of sucks for you because your books are going to speak to people who are upset about these things <laughs> because you were kind of already you were already aware and for people who are just becoming aware over the last you know couple years or or however long uh, well, that's, what, this. <laughs> that's what the jokes are for <laughs> i've grown past this <laughs> So, so uh, now you get to babysit us. <laughs> there's always, I don't know, I think that's what stories are for. You can present, you know, you can present what you're worried about in the world and you can set up some characters to fight against it. And, you know, stories, I think perhaps we give media too much credits now and then, but um, it does certainly, if, I guess, not inform your worldview, but... I guess rub up against it that's a a very strange way of putting that so you know there's a core of optimism in everything I write really um I do believe in having a story where there are heroes and objectives and hope um even in my more bleaker stuff um yeah but um yeah, I don't. I think I am funda- fundamentally optimistic about humanity as well. I think sometimes we get a little bogged down um, with how terrible things are, particularly when that's all the focus is and where what gets the clicks, and we forget that there are third world kids out there with supercomputers in their pockets who can learn new languages at the touch of a button, who can share stories and images with people on the other side of the planet, and. Uh, you know, if you're not impressed and excited about that, man, I don't know what you want. <laughs> so we, just, as of today, they just made oxygen on Mars. I mean, ain't that incredible? <laughs> I haven't. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have to look that up. I did not know that. Well, there you go. That's, that's something to be optimistic about. The boundless oxygen on Mars. Sorry. <laughs> I can edit uh, this out if you want. This is just like information for me. I did. I know this wasn't what you intended to come on for today, but what? It was one of the experiments of the current NASA drive up there. They flew a little helicopter up there and they have a, what did they call it? Moxie, a Moxie device, which I can't remember how it works, but basically transforms the atmosphere into a, an amount of oxygen. Shit. So you can remember, I think that, the boundless kind of cruelty and senselessness of the world. Humanity has made this house of cards of ideas and beliefs and passions and all these great things which have given us incredible technology and philosophies that just don't exist in the natural world. And if you're only looking at the dark side of that, I don't know, I think maybe adjust your perspective a bit there's a wonderful line from terry pratchett in the hogfather i think i'm gonna butcher it now because i can't remember it word for word but it's he's talking about the importance of stories and uh he says you know take the universe and grind it down to its finest uh component and put it through the finest sieve and show me a single molecule of justice and mercy. It's like, they don't exist. These are things we made up. These are stories we told ourselves and aspired as a species to be like. And we still kind of get really downhearted when uh, we behave like selfish apes. It's like, that was kind of the starting ground. (laughs) Um, So yeah, it's plenty to be optimistic about. If you ever want a sense of perspective, look at your cat. There is something that has absolutely no worries in the world at all. It has human slaves who provide everything for it. And it'll still behave like a total bastard and go out and murder something for fun. Because that's, that's the way it is. Yeah, man, I, 
I love cats, but they are <laughs> mean motherfuckers. And it's funny too, because they can love you and just still just, you know, tear you to shreds because mm-hmm. you pet, pet their belly on the wrong day. You know, you you quoted uh you quoted your Terry Pratchett earlier. Yours as if you own you own Terry Pratchett. He's in your yeah, yeah. he's in your closet or your basement somewhere. <laughs> um, but there was a line in one of your books about one person looking at the universe and seeing chaos, and another person looking at that same thing and seeing intelligent design. What do you see when you look up at the cosmos? Um that goes back to what we imprint on the world around us. I think you learn about the world and uh, you grow up and you learn that not everything you were taught is fundamentally true or strictly true. And that some of those things are outright lies, lies, but uh, entirely necessary. And then one day you learn that the color blue that you see might not be the same color blue that the person next to you see and then as far as i'm concerned at that point you're fucked um, <laughs> because you can get into this kind of perception relativism and it's very easy for somebody with just enough intelligence to deconstruct everything to either meaningless or meaninglessness or an excuse not to care so the reality is, the cold, hard reality of it is, without human interpretation, it is just everything. It's just chaos and random. Uh, with scientific interpretation, it, there's order. But it's only through this kind of shared belief and understanding we have of those around us, which is getting bigger and bigger every year because of technology. Um that's the only thing that not that gives humanity meaning, but makes humanity really. Without it, we're just uh, we're not defined as anything. Yeah, man, I like that. Cheers, because beer is good. Beer is good. <laughs> what was the coolest <laughs> conversation that you can remember offhand with just a random person that you bumped into? Oh, you ruined it by Before. what you can remember part about that. <laughs> okay, you don't have to remember it. Just make it up. Make it up. I used to uh, I used to smoke. Uh, I, I've recently given up. I've given up for over a year now. I used to love the smoking area because they banned smoking indoors and you could go outside and smoke. And you'd really just kind of hit it off with people out there. I got pretty good for an introvert. I could get in a zone... Um, I just had the right amount of beer in the right environment, a pack of cigarettes, and you could just uh, make friends with anyone. And um, just briefly, just like temporary friends and get a perspective on the world that might be maddeningly strange or weirdly problematic or, you know, really relatable. But um, I don't know if I can remember specific conversations I'll tell, I'll tell you one. Um, at the Orphans and Dragons Con, before the world shut down in please 2019. Tell me, please, please tell me this was when you were in your outfit. <laughs> that beautiful, perfect costume. <laughs> and you looked so upset <laughs> to be wearing it. Uh, no, I, I think I changed out of it by then, which probably for the best. <laughs> I was talking to a chap there, Dan, his name was, and he just um, he was talking to me about the Brandon Firemaster character who is a character I play on a podcast and he's kind of a Zen monk, but inverted. He believes that um, there's, it's not about spirit. It's about physical perfection. You reach spiritual perfection by becoming physically perfect. So he's very self-centered and thinks in order to be one of the universe, he has to be that the universe is a perfect entity. So he has to become a perfect entity. And the guy was just chatting to me about, I think Drew on, Drew on the podcast put it best when he said, Brandon Firemaster is a dumb white guy's version of a Kung Fu monk, which is, isn't entirely. That's not, fair. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. <laughs> you know, if you, if you kind of, if you watch anime or read 
watch old kung fu movies there are plenty of like there are plenty of global versions of this kind of you know strip away all the actual serious elements of it and just keep the cool shit part of monks but yeah dumb white guys version of a, of a zen monk's probably a great way of summing them up but um yeah i was just talking to this guy and he just started talking about his fear, theory of where this temple of the many fists which is the problematically named uh, religion he follows um philosophy came from and uh he was talking about the universe coming into, into creation and the scientific probability of the mirror universe and how the taking the kind of like the mirror aspect of that literally and how uh, all life was created as kind of something that can observe its perfection. It's basically it's this kind of like narcissist universe universe theory he came up with i was like i'm gonna steal that for the podcast thank you <laughs> so that was a fun one that was uh just one that we that i remembered now see i remembered that one so um <laughs> yeah, i do miss random conversations with drunk people That's yeah true. just running into people smoking in you know the park or whatever I am one of those people that will come up and talk to strangers. Like my parents raised me better than that, but I have just, <laughs> just one of those loud mouth people. So what about Authors and Dragons Con this year? Are you looking forward to it or a little bit scared of it? Or <laughs> No, I'm really looking forward to it. It looks like we wouldn't be having it if we weren't confident it could go ahead safely. And I know um, things are, you know, not to get too much into the depressing aspect of the lockdown and everything, but things are really progressing finally in my country and i know america's kind of i think now leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else so that's great so i think I'm not worried at all about having the convention and i think we've already sold a nice chunk of tickets and we know from the last time we had the convention that we couldn't ask for a better audience we had such a great time it was absolutely it was mind blowing. I think most of us were in a state of shock for the entire weekend. And I'm gonna, you know, some of the guys on the podcast are are grizzled veterans compared to me, but uh, even they were kind of blown away just by the sheer, I don't know, sincere connection we had with the people who attended that con. So if we can do that again, I'm happy. It will be, it will be brilliant. Yeah, let's let's hope so. I hope everyone, uh, as many people who can get there, do get there, and we all have a great time because God knows we've earned it. Man, for real. Well, I am definitely uh, good and buzzed. Me too. My phone, <laughs> my phone has gone pink. That's how you can tell that this is going down well. I, pink and unusual, that is. I, I have enjoyed this so much that I like really just don't even want it to end, but I will let you get back to whatever you are doing with your day and just thank you so much. And if anybody is watching this and you haven't read uh, Steve Wetherill's work, start with the Doomsayer series and then, you know, move into the other more obscure stuff, but there's some really thoughtful and you need to, you need to read it. And, uh, or if you can't read then download the audio book because we'll also say there is a probably in the next month or so so it hasn't been confirmed yet a new installment in the Doom, doomsayer journeys going to be released to file stuff books so i oh. want to read everything before that happens just putting it out there man okay more more information about false staff books i'm just becoming increasingly intrigued by this quote-unquote small um mm. publishing company um they are with so many great writers the covers mm. look awesome and they have been consistently putting out good books for a couple of years now just That's what john does he uh he, he goes to conventions and he poaches writers he just uh collects them like some kind of mad octopus <laughs> the the monster hunter that guy <laughs> well um i'm gonna probably link fall staff books down there too because there's there's a lot of stuff going on with that that everybody needs to check out whether you're a reader or just someone 
uh, who's looking to write, I mean, obviously, if you're writing, you should probably be reading too. Um, <laughs> a writer or a reader of science fiction, fantasy, romance, they have so many great genres, so many good books. Um, <laughs> Uh, but thank you so much for coming on. It's been an awesome conversation and I look forward to uh, seeing you when I do get to go to the Authors and Dragons Con eventually. I look forward to seeing you too. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>